Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the American Battlefield Trust and our continued coverage around the Shiloh Battlefield. We have been all over the place. Not only we've been to Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, but we've been all over Shiloh. And as the Confederate juggernaut moves closer and closer um, toward the Union force, pushing them not toward their objective, but toward Pittsburgh Landing, one of the most uh, you know, well-known and yet misunderstood actions of the entire battle is going to take place around here. We have not one, not two, but three or, or more guests this time, so we're really happy. And we have somebody who hasn't joined us yet today, Tim Smith. Now, you may have heard of Tim Smith before. There's two or three different Tim Smiths. There's other people that want to be Tim Smith, but this one's the real deal. This is Dr. Timothy, Timothy B. Smith, former ranger up here, professor at Middle Tennessee State University. We'll be hearing from him soon, and he's got a cooler accent than I do. But let's start with our good friend, General Parker Hill, Battle Focus Tours. Uh, I believe it's UT Martin. Am UT I right? Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Middle, that's Middle Tennessee State. Sorry, yeah, Tennessee, <laughs> right? So that's, that's good enough. Yeah, you got Tennessee. I guess that's close enough. <laughs> we are here in Sarah Bell's mule pen, and uh, just uh, by, in front of me, I'd say a bit, oh, basically a third of a mile. Uh, is the Peach Orchard and the uh, Sunken Road, uh, uh, which is really not sunken, but it is a road. Uh, and as the Confederates have come away from Benjamin Mayberry Apprentice's camps and have come across roads here, remember Albert Sidney Johnston now has picked up the little silver cup there as he was chiding the lieutenants. He's also left his surgeon, Dr. Yandell, behind. Uh, the troops come in here, they come out of this ravine, and they receive uh, a lot of fire from massed artillery and small arms fire. And these are, a lot of these are Tennessee troops are unseasoned, and they will fall back down in this ravine. And they were, they were act literally cowering in this ravine. Uh, General, uh, General Breckenridge will ride over. General Johnston is off to my right front, about 200 yards. Uh, he's talking to the, uh, the Confederate governor of Tennessee and some other folks. And John Cabell Breckenridge will ride up and say, General, I have some troops down here who will not charge. Uh, General Johnston will look at, look at him like, what do, you, what do you mean, General? You've got troops that won't charge. And the Confederate governor of Tennessee uh, says, you know, ah, they're my troops. I'll go down there and rally them. He goes down there, and they, they send him back with his tail between his legs. And uh, now Breckenridge is to the point of where he is. Uh, he tries to go back down and rally them again. And so now we have uh, the former vice president of the United States, Confederate governor of Tennessee, trying to rally these troops. And Johnston says, I, I believe they will charge. And he gets them down here in this ravine. He rides up and down the line. He starts spinning this spin, this, uh, this silver cup on his finger. And this is in the famous Troiani painting that's entitled Men of Arkansas. I, I'm not going to talk about the title of the painting, but I think the, the uh, painting itself is highly accurate of the terrain. I, I'm convinced that Dor uh, Don Troiani came down here and looked at this ground, or at least maybe somebody like Tim Smith sent him some photos, because it's very accurate. It's a marvelous painting. And he's riding up and down the line. He's tapping each bayonet with a silver cup. He says, men, they are stubborn. We must give them the bayonet. Remember, he's already given them a bayonet talk this morning to the Arkansas men. And that's when he does it this morning. Men of Arkansas. This so now he's riding up and down the line. And he says, and I will lead you. And then he says, he looks, he says, and the governor here is going to lead you. And General Brecken says, now we've got the highest ranking general in the Confederate Army. We've got the governor of Tennessee, Confederate. And we've got the former vice president of the United States going to lead a charge. And they will come out of this ravine and charge into the peach orchard. As they charge into the peach orchard, General Johnston is going to catch a mini ball behind his right knee. Now, it's important to understand that he was wounded in a duel when he was in Texas uh, with, a, with the Texans there and with a man named Felix Houston. He took a ball that nicked his sciatic nerve. And he doesn't have feelings in his right leg very well. This ball will nick his popliteal artery. And he's got high boots on and he doesn't know it, but he's bleeding to death. He's also had a mini ball that severed the sole of his left boot and he's had a mini ball, a spent ball that's bruised his right thigh. So now uh, he's, he's, he's elated because they have broken the line uh, over there at the sunken road. They've driven, they've driven the federal troops back and the road to Pittsburgh Landing here is open. He's at the right place at the right time. Now, he will die, so we'll never know what was in his mind. His detractors will often say, well, he just didn't know what he was doing. 
I don't believe in coincidences. He was here where he should have been. He broke the line and had it been penetrated at that moment and exploited, we'll never know what would have happened, but it would have had a whole lot better chance of winning. But instead, he will bleed to death. Dr. Yandel, if you recall, uh, Johnson surgeon has been left behind at uh, Benjamin Mayberry Apprentice's camp to take care of federal wounded. Johnson doesn't know, he's got, but he know he's got a tourniquet in his pocket, but he doesn't know to tie this wound because he doesn't feel it. Uh, he's celebrating, he's showing off uh, to, to the governor and others, uh, this, his, the sole of his boot's been severed, and suddenly he will reel in the saddle and fall, and they will have to carry him into the, this ravine, only about 300 yards to my right, where he will bleed to death around 2.45 p.m. on the 6th of April, uh, 1862 and uh, there will be almost a two to three hour delay waiting on, uh, waiting on uh, someone to assume command of these troops. And while that's happening, the window of opportunity is closing. And once it closes, it's gone forever. And it will be gone by, by, by the time Beauregard will take command of this army. Tell me you got the comments here. Well, I just always kind of thought in the back of my mind, what is, what's going through Johnson's mind mm -hmm. at this point? Why is that in the mule lot here? and, and um, you know, Johnson has, has uh, he's under a cloud. He's lost Kentucky, most of Tennessee, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, all that. He's falling back. Um, the Confederate delegation of Tennessee Congress calling for his, his removal, all but like three members of it. Uh, and so, you know, he's looking at this situation, street situation, and, and he realizes that if we're going to fight here, the best chance we got is to fight Grant's army before Buell gets here. So we, we've got a limited opportunity here, uh, and even then it's a gamble. But we got a we got a gamble because we don't have a chance after this. The iron dice of war. That's what he tells somebody. We got to roll the iron dice of battle. So this is a gamble, and you know it's also somewhat of a gamble for his own reputation too. He's more interested in the Confederacy and the army and, and so on. But who? can't be in this situation and look at your own fortunes as well. You can't I mean, be a you, leader without you, an ego. You can't separate without an ego. You can't separate your, your own personal um, feelings from this. And so, you know, I think about when he gets on the battlefield and gets down in this ravine here and he's watching his whole purpose is to turn that Union left flank and it ain't working. They're, mm -hmm. they're stalled here. Mm -hmm. And this is the climactic point of the big gamble and it, it, it's not working, it's not going forward. And so he decides, I gotta get in there myself and make this happen. Um, and you know, if it if it takes risk in my own life to do this, and there's been a lot of arguments, and you're a, you're a general, um, but some you know argue, hey, the the commanding general shouldn't be on the front lines. Uh, his job's back in in the back. But if your key component of your key plan of the key gamble is not going forward, you better get up there and lead it it's to make it to the make it go on the line. You'd better get in you there. You better get in there. And uh, a lot of his rhetoric, you know, he talks about. Um, most famously, we must this day conquer or perish. This is do or die time. We got to win or die. This, this, the, the, those are the only two choices. And so he gets on the battlefield here in, in this climactic point, uh, and he says, "I've, you know, do or die. I've got to make this happen, and I'm going to lead it." And unfortunately, he, uh, you know, conquer or perish. He perishes instead of conquers. And uh, a lot of people argue the South went with it. So South perished here at uh, at Shiloh as well. So probably a lot of truth in that. So let's, uh, you know, we, we have we have some other things we want to see. I don't know if we'll get all the way there, but let's uh, allow you some moments of Zen. Chris is going to turn around and show you the view of what some of these Texans and others would have experienced. Thank 
Texans come out of the woods, they find me waiting on the edge of the field to buy time so that the rest of the historians can get here and continue this story. So it's a stunning moment for those Texans. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, and, and just look at it, though. I mean, just imagine the Union Army. Maybe they're just about to break. And, and I mean, you can't write this better, right? Here you have the highest ranking Confederate field general. And let's walk while we talk here. You know, here he is on the cusp of victory. He rallies the troops himself. He had sent his doctor away. He had a tourniquet in his pocket. He had an old wound that prevented him from, you know, feeling this new wound. I mean, you can't write this stuff better. And it's no surprise that Johnston would become the thing of legend, specifically his wounding and death. So maybe one of you guys could come up. Uh, we're about to hit some more leaves, so we'll be quiet for a sec. But when they come back, we're going to talk about the mortuary cannon in front of us and, and what used to be there as well. So let's go down this hill here. So we've been talking about mortuary cannons all day. We've seen some of, we've seen a good percentage of the total number that are actually here, but let me invite Parker or Tim, whoever wants to walk up, up here to sort of, nobody's walking up. How is this possible? <laughs> you know, so here's the mortuary cannon. There used to be something else here that was maybe marked and everything like that, and neither of them are right. So what's going on here? Well, there was an oak tree. Uh, it was here where Johnston fell off. It was just behind the monument. There used to be a wrought iron fence around it. When I first came up here as a kid, uh, it was a pretty good sized tree. It died and eventually uh, it rotted away to the point they had to tear it down and tear the fence down. But there was an oak tree here uh, that, that was designated as the spot where General Johnston uh, had to be taken off of his horse and then he was carried down into the ravine where we'll go where he uh, where he bled to death they they couldn't see that he was bleeding to death these were not trained medical people there was no doctor around and they're trying to feed him brandy uh, but he can't be fit brandy he can't drink uh, he's leading, losing blood so fast that by the time even if Dr. Yandel had gotten here he would have lost too much blood by the time he's gone so it, it's a fateful decision back at Mayberry's camp a simple tourniquet could have saved his life now this thing and I'll bring Tim in while we walk here um, <laughs> you know this thing that you know so there's a tree here there was a sign on that tree and there's a mortuary can and this isn't where it happened but you know, what did it happen? Seven, he did, bled out 75 yards away. Why does this matter, getting it right, Tim? Well, uh, obviously it matters to history, but um, you're, this is one of those things, there's nothing wrong with historians saying we just simply don't know um, in, in certain cases. Uh, and then when things get marked, all of a sudden it becomes the gospel, and sometimes it's, it's not. For instance, the marker here, the monument, uh, really has nothing to do with his wounding or his death. That's where Governor Harris found him underneath this famous famous tree. Um, and so we really don't know where Johnson was hit. We know he's on the front of Bowen's Brigade, which is on the, uh, the west side of the River Road here, but the River Road kind of cuts at an angle in front, so he could have crossed over in, into this area. It was interesting, back in the, I believe, sesquicentennial, I was out here doing a tour with Charlie Rowland, the biography of, of, uh, excellent, excellent. of uh, Albert Sidney Johnson and John Marzalate. We were doing tours, and Professor Rowland was talking about this, and he said, we just really don't know exactly where he was because they didn't mark the spot. Nobody marked the spot. Uh, but it's a pretty good indication he wasn't at the top of the monument there, you know, at the, at the time. Um, that's where he rode to this high ground here to, to look around, and that's where Harris finds him. And then he dies down, uh, obviously, in the... Um, in the ravine but the reason the tree becomes famous and gets misconstrued as the death tree is that immediately after the park was established in 1894 um, visitors hearing that there is a park here they start flocking to shallow and so we want to see shallow but there's nothing here there are no monuments or you know it takes years to do the cannons and the monuments and tablets and all that kind of stuff. So there's nothing here. So the park commission decided we got to put something up to at least just show people, you know. So they start cutting poplar boards about that big uh, and writing on, painting on them, you know, paint them white and with red letters and so on. They start nailing these things up all over the battlefield at places like the Bloody Pond and the, the Hornet's Nest and, uh, you know, the, the Johnston tree and so on. And these are the things that become seared into people's minds. Oh, that's the, the stuff to see at Shallow. That's the most important stuff to see at Shallow. And and that's one of the reasons that this tree that, again, had nothing to do with his wounding or his death, um, it became sacred and, and kind of becomes the icon associated with, the, with Johnson's death when, uh, in reality, he died down in the, in the ravine down there.
And I'll hop in in just a second and we'll walk and talk. And it reminds me of when they put up the monument at Chancellorsville for Stonewall Jackson, because I gotta find a way to work him in while we're talking here. But they put up these monuments as signifiers for tourists. So when tourists come, they've got something to see so that they feel that they're getting an experience. But just like for those of you who, for instance, go to Gettysburg and you have to take your pilgrimage to Little Round Top, it's a beloved place. And the stump here for, for decades and decades was one of those beloved landmarks on the battlefield that becomes its own thing and that people have their own attachments to. The Park Service went to great lengths to try to preserve that stump over the decades as it began to rot away and die. They put a, a, a copper cap over the top of it. They tried to prop it up, that fence to protect it. And when they finally had to tear the thing down, there was great outcry from a lot of Battlefield fans because this beloved icon of the battlefield was vanishing. It became part of the cultural landscape, as we talk about in interpretive terms, part of the cultural landscape of the park, and that's why it takes on such importance. But as we get down here into this ravine, and we've been talking about terrain all day, and so you've seen us come down, Chris is gonna hop over this little kind of the dry tricklet here. Don't trip over the one behind you. But you can see, like, this is just crazy, tumultuous terrain. And going back to what Tim said a second ago, it's no wonder we can't find the spot. But look how crazy this is. Now imagine if it's all greened out, it's thick, dense foliage. It can be very disconcerting, very confusing. But now that we've come down here, um, there used to be a marker here that talked about the story, drawing on the text from uh, Isham Harris's account of Johnston's wounding, and that used to tell the story down here. So I kind of like to come down here and think, you know, you get away from the roads, you get away from civilization, you get away from the monuments and markers, and you can be down here in this quiet little hollow. And regardless of the spot, you can start to get a sense of what those final moments must have been like for Johnson as his life is literally bleeding away, as his staff and his close people are around him and they're wondering, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? Johnson was the one holding this attack together, trying to get it back on the rails. And now that personal leadership is gone. We've talked about the example he's been setting on the battlefield, the compassion he's been showing, the strong personal leadership. And imagine huddled around that dying man thinking, what? now. And that, of course, is going to be a question that's going to ripple over 161 years. Uh, 159, let me get my math correct. 159. Gosh, what now, now that Johnson is gone? Parker, you've come down here a lot. How do you feel about all that? Oh, uh, well, I've got to throw in something personal. Dr. Smith mentioned uh, Charles Rowland's, Charlie Rowland's marvelous biography in Albert Sidney Johnston. And decades ago, I was reading this thing. And I'm seeing this wonderful quote by the light in his eyes, a spark in his breast. And it was just a marvelous quote. And I look at the end of the footnote, and it's from Clausewitz. I said, wait a minute, that's not the Clausewitz they taught us in the War College, which is as dry as eating a styrofoam ice chest. Uh, 700 pages of misery. Uh, and I looked and I looked at the version of it and it was the pre-1976 Princeton edition that went back to uh, the early 20th century, 1908 if I recall correctly. And uh, I managed to find a copy of that and it opened up Clausewitz to me because the modern version has sanitized it to the point that it is eating an ice chest and the, 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 the romantic, the vivid language was taken out of it in order to, uh, to get a more proper pronunciation of German. So I always thank Charles Rowland for introducing me to the Clausewitz that I, can, can, I now know and love and read and study all the time. Uh, now picture Johnston, uh, he's lying here He's slowly, and his, his face is beginning to turn white as he's losing all of his blood. His staff off, they don't know what to do. They try to give him brandy, and eventually he expires, okay? Now, they are, they, they don't want the troops to know he's dead. They put a blanket over the body, and they uh, secret it off the battlefield. Uh, it will eventually be taken back to Corinth, to Mrs. Rose Inge's cottage, Johnson's headquarters there, uh, and they will, uh, they will embalm him with corn liquor. What a way to go, right? And uh, eventually his body would be taken to New Orleans. And uh, after, uh, it, it was, uh, after the war during Reconstruction, you could not have a, a Confederate uh, gatherings or whatever. His body was eventually secretly taken to Austin, Texas, and is buried in the state cemetery there. Uh, and now uh, it's the, the state cemetery is a beautiful place to visit. The first time I saw it, it was pretty ramshackle, but they have now used some rails and trails money to redo the cemetery. So General Johnston ends up there. But back to this battle. 
Uh, it's now, they're trying to find General Beauregard. Uh, General Beauregard is way off on the other side of the battlefield. Uh, when they finally find their General Beauregard to take command, they, again, as I mentioned to you, the window of opportunity has been closed. Uh, Grant has built his final defensive line, and uh, now it's, it's not only is it closed, it's been nailed shut. Uh, whether we, we'll never know what Johnson's intention was, as Tim said. We'll never know that. Uh, but I always say he was at the right place at the right time to execute possibly a coup de grace. But that didn't happen. He went down and, and the window closed and was nailed shut. So all of this uh, really starts. Uh, it started way back when he motivates the troops. Way back, if you want to go further back, to when he took basically took command from Beauregard and realized Beauregard was not the commander of this army. His feet were made of clay and I am going to command this army. Then he goes and leads the Arkansas troops at Shea Field, and he loves that. Uh, then he, he, he leads this attack out here and he realizes, as Dr. Smith said, he had to do this. Whether he's a four-star general or not, this was the climax here for the Confederacy. And he had to be there, and he was. And it cost him his life. So we'll never know his intention after that. And I think that adds to the enigma of Albert Sidney Johnston. We're forced to judge him on, on a much smaller slice of combat than we would like to, to understand the man. And we're forced to, and this is add to the, added to the romantic nature of him. So we got a lot more to do today still. Thanks to Chris White behind the camera, Chris Makowski, uh, Parker Hills, and Timothy B. Smith. Um, for doing, uh, you know, covering this really important moment. We've got more to do. Thanks for joining us. Go to battlefields.org for more, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.